all my podcast people, and thank you for joining me for yet another episode of my favorite podcast. We got a guest in the house with us today, and she has not been here since October 14th, 2019. It's very funny. When you record podcasts, you kind of think, oh, I just had that person on, and suddenly it was like, oh, that was like almost four years ago. I brought this incredible human on four plus four years ago to nerd out, and I was like, you know what? My audience is still full of nerds, still full of movement geeks, and I want to bring her back on because not only does she have that aspect, she's got the business slant, and I was like, you know what? Let's come back on and have a chat. Today, I have with me my good friend, co-founder of the Neuro Studio, and firm believer that if you have a brain, then we are doing Neuro with you, the one and only Meg Coppell Duffy. Welcome back, friend. <laughs> I hello, was trying hello, to, hello. I was trying to remember how your dad, how your dad introduces you, and I was like, "Fuck, I can't remember." He says every time I call him, "Is this the famous Megan Copel Duffy?" And I'm like, "It's still me, Dad. Seriously, are we still doing this?" Like, and then my mom answers the phone. Who's this? <laughs> <laughs> Who calls you, mom? <laughs> This is why I love yeah. her, folks. She's real. Anytime we talk, it just goes on and goes on and goes on. She's one of my favorite people because she's also from the best state, not California, the East Coast best The right state. coast. That's it. Dirty jurors. <laughs> dirty, dirty jurors. So, Meg, when we when we first hopped on before the episode started, uh, I was like, yo, you were on in October 14th, 2019. And you were like, I'd like to say that I've grown a lot since then, but I'm probably the same. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I you... mean, in business, in, you know, my process, in my expertise, yes, you know, personally. Yes, I like this. Still, still that bitch. <laughs> still, still that bitch, still eating the gluten-free Oreos. I don't know about that, but I still love you. So, Well, I do have celiac, and as celiac, as gluten-free cookies go, Oreo, the gluten-free Oreos are the only edible ones. All the other cookies get stuck in your teeth. It's a whole process. <laughs> so if anybody else has celiac, gluten-free, but you have to do double stuffed, yeah, you're going to so have to floss after, but it will be worth it. amount of frosting. So for anyone that yeah. wants the full background on Megan, we will link episode 150. Thank you, Courtney. But Meg, you want to do us a, a solid and do like a little brief overview of kind of who you are. And then I want us to jump right into kind of your approach because cool. today, today we're, we're being movement nerds. Yeah. So real quick background. I have my master's degree in applied physiology. I've been a Pilates teacher and a movement professional for, I think it's like 22 years now. I started Pilates by chance because I was going to college to do sports specific training. And unfortunately at the time in some of the internships, um, being a woman, it didn't work in my favor where I either would get hit on or ignored. And I said to myself, do I want to show up every day to work proving I'm competent? I had more to say. So my thoughts are, let me get in through the back door, kind of go in that way and work with athletes in that way. But what I realized in owning a Pilates studio in Hoboken, New Jersey for many years, I had one neuro client. Somebody called me, a PT friend of mine said, hey, Megan, do you know how to work with MS? And I said, of course I do. I was 24 you know, had the ego the size of this, the square. And I had to Google, what is MS? So I always share that story because, you know, you and I talk about superhero origin stories. Like, how did we get here? I literally Googled, what is MS? So I've traveled the world teaching my methods, especially for MS. And it started with the Google. So it's kind of like a little bit of lesson. It doesn't have to be this deep, profound story um, of why you're where you're at. So yeah. fast forward, after Googling it, there was like nothing. It was like stretching, okay? So that kind of started the neuro approach. Um, again, we talked about in an episode one, I don't want to bore the fans. I always say I'll tell you more about you myself over a drink. But what was really profound to me is learning styles and different brains and neurodivergent and neurotypical brains. And I was lucky in school. I think you were the same. I tested really well. Mm -hmm. I'm an audit. I really learned through auditory. Um, I was good in lectures. I take in stuff. Psh. I did a post yesterday about like, I still have textbooks in plastic. 
So I was lucky that I did well in school. So, you know, you you got labeled smart and uh, good stuff. Totally. But what I've seen with clients, my husband, friends, is learning is not always catered to you. It's kind of catered to what the teacher likes to do. Not surprising. Mm -hmm. I love to lecture. So I love to learn. Yeah. Right. Have you ever done this where you're like lecturing and you're like, holy shit, that was really good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like comes out naturally. I'm like, oh, I've never said it like that before. Did someone get that? So someone write for that down? me looking at it, what'd you say? Yeah, write that down. Write, write that down. Write me. that down. Thank you. But coming from a neuro approach is I'm realizing we're missing the boat on so many people. So my methods developed with people with neurological conditions. But what I always say is everybody's a neuro client. So it's not just looking at learning styles. It's looking at the sensory environment, what speaks to them, bringing all this information in and just saying it. That's a lot of shit, right? Can be Uh overwhelming. Listen, there's different methods that people use and muscle testing, whatever works for you. But I wanted to create a way where my students could kind of assess every movement on the go. I don't like to assess things, then do something, then assess it again. That works for so many people. It does not work for my brain. So that's kind of where the four quadrant stability model came in. Still not the sexiest name. We we talked about this, uh, Maestro, but it is what it is. It's not sexy. It's the basics. This, this, this right here. Uh, Can we back it up for one second? So. Why did I say a lot in that spiel? Like, but I, got I threw it. a lot of shit against the wall. We're from, we're from the same, we're cut from the same cloth. Why like, we get along? Me. Give it to me. Again, for you folks listening, this is why I brought Meg on because I know that for the majority of you, this audience started as, you know, following the movement maestro and like kind of the movement uh, journeys and things like that and that side of things. And so brought her on to get back into that because I know that that still interests people. And for me, I want to expose people to as many different approaches Yes, I'm biased, so it's approaches that I agree with, but as many different approaches as I agree with as possible so that you have as many tools at your disposal so that you can also choose how you want to be going about things, right? My whole shtick, build your best life, and the way that you're going to do that is by having options. So in getting to work with Megan and actually get treated by Megan and getting exposed to this, I was like, hey, let's open people's eyes. Let's let's expose them to this approach as well. You know, I brought um, Anna Hartman on the podcast. I've had Jill Miller on the podcast and we're looking at these different approaches to things. And I was like, I want to bring Megan back on and talk about this because also this, we're going to, I'm going to say a neuro approach. It is still very sexy, right? Where when I was treating, people were starting to realize that pain was the big thing and realizing that pain's an experience and like, yes, starting to view every client as a neuro client, but Megan has a different um, experience with that and treating what we would traditionally consider to be a neurological patient and then saying, hey, how does this uh, how does this tie into how does this work for the general population? And oh, also, like, how can my students use this? And I was as she's explaining these things to me, I'm like, yes, I want more people to be hearing this, because if I was still treating, this is something that I would want to want to learn. So one of the things you said in there was that kind of the test and then um, have them do the thing and then kind of retest again and have them do the thing. It doesn't work for your brain. Can you explain that a little bit? No. So as you can tell by the way I talk, things move a bit fast up in here, right? So I needed approach. And even when I move, I don't like to do the same workout twice, okay? I realized lifting and doing the buys the, 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 the of this – I don't enjoy doing that. I need a variety. That's how my brain works best. So what I love, listen, you and I, we connect on a lot of things, but like the more you idea is what I do with clients is I'm going to optimize, help you be the best version of yourself. Okay. So wherever you are on the brain spectrum, on the movement spectrum, it's let's assess each movement based off how your brain responds in real time. Okay, so I don't want to set up, do all this stuff and give them the strategies. So I know you, you're you mm-hmm, always telling mm-hmm. me, talk more cerebellum. The there cerebellum is, is part down. of the brain that I'm, I know, right? That's written <laughs> you're always like, more down. cerebellum. So it was interesting to me. There's always like these like cerebellum drills. And listen, I'm totally transparent. 
When we're talking about cerebellum strategies, do I know for a fact I'm targeting someone's cerebellum? No, I don't have electrodes on their brain. But the cerebellum should be the ultimate teacher. And if we give the clients all the cues, all the strategies, tell them how to do things, they're never having the opportunity to use their cerebellum. Okay. So for example, Shantae, when I was at your place, we used pressure. So I use pressure as a sensory stimulus to trigger a response in your cerebellum to pick a different movement pattern. Okay. So just one example of doing this. Now I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go big and, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna come back in is when we're looking at a neuro approach is I look at everything. So right now I'm watching you. You've got your hand on the chin. So maybe when I give an exercise, I'm gonna bring a sensory strategy to your jaw. Maybe you're doing this a lot. So I teach my students how to observe everything. And this sounds to people overwhelming, but it's yeah. not. And the reason I got here was. I need to know the whys. My brain gets very focused. And if you can't break it down to the simplest form, that's why I love our conversations. Because yep. if it's not simple, it ain't it. Right? Totally. So when we're looking at something, if that can't be expressed simply, I just it, it doesn't speak to me. So yeah, when I would totally. ask professors, I'm, I remember one particular moment. Uh, when someone has a lower back injury, their multifidi turn off. That was the verbiage that was used. And I'm like, word? Why? Word? And they're like, because the multifidi turn off. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not deaf. I'm asking why. And they're like, well, when you have a lower back injury, <sighs> the multifidi turn off. And what I realized is they did not know why. They just were repeating what they were told totally. and then observed. Totally. So for me, the multifidi don't turn off and on. And when we're saying we're activating versus not, their multifidi were never active because they were never able to isolate their lumbar spine. Okay? So if you can't isolate your lumbar spine, why would your multifidi be active? That leads to a lower back injury. Thus, multifidi is still not active. Now, that's just a story we're telling. I don't know if that's the exact reason for that person, mm -hmm. but for me, it's always got to be the why. And I work with my, my mentees, my students, I want them to break it down so they can explain it to people simply. I believe in educating clients. They're smart. They can handle it. So back to the four quadrant stability model, it's basics. So my mother, Maureen Claire McAlevey is her maiden name. She's a little Irish. She used to always say, don't assume things. It makes an ass out of you and me. That's right. And that sticks in my brain. So I don't assume things. And you and I talked about this. Everybody's assuming stability when things aren't moving. Everybody's assuming joint differentiation. Let me tell you, nobody, no. none of you listening, no. even Shantae and I cannot differentiate our lower back from our pubic bone, from our hip joint, from our SI joint as much as we would like. Okay, so the other piece of this whole puzzle is we use an assessment model in a movement. I know which quadrant mm -hmm. I'm assessing based off what I'm doing to test for reflexive stability, to test for joint differentiation, so we can add an intervention immediately. I like that. That should uh, be my. It's graphic. recorded, baby. There we go. All right, it's in there. Okay, I'm gonna stop doing. I'm doing too much. I mean, when it comes it's to like the picking a scab, case, it's like one too many. <laughs> when it comes so to you, that's what I want my students to feel empowered. And what I love is one of my mentees, do you got a little cocky with me? And I was like, all right. But he explained something simply in a way that resonated with people. Was it a concept I talk about all the time? But he put it in his, his words and it resonated with people. And just seeing him kind of step out into his own light and realize he knows what he's talking about. It's awesome. That's why I do this. Awesome. I am a teacher. I love teaching people. And I love seeing people kind of see themselves for the first time. Yeah. My God, are you going to make me? Share that. I never Here cry. Here Always. it comes. So we joked. I said to Shantae, my goal is not to cry this Here one. Here it comes. Gary made it's me cry happen. in 09. He's still making me cry today. <laughs> Killing. Megan, I want to back but up. It's emotional because people don't see themselves at all, at all. I mean, I mean, no. I like to see we talked about that as one of your gifts that like you you do truly see people. And so that actually kind of ties into the question I have. I think when you have the gift of seeing people, it can make 
sifting through all of the possibilities of how to intervene a bit easier because you're like, yeah, I'm going to do that. And you're comfortable leaning into that. One of the things you just said was when we're going to kind of more you this treatment approach and we're going to, you know, give you a tactile cue that revol- that involves like touching, scratching your head or, you know, putting your hand on your chin because that's what we, we were both kind of doing at that moment, that that can be very overwhelming to a mentee, someone that's new to this, like, well, I have a million options. This is overwhelming. Can you speak to that again and kind of how you coach someone through this? And, and you're kind of like, okay, I hear it's overwhelming, but here's how we make it less overwhelming. Now, I know you and I are the same. And what I've realized is people always ask for a system. They oh love systems. They love them. Megan. Okay. Number one, if anybody's listening and needs someone to name or come up with a system, dude, Jill, Jill. is like, that's what her brand what does. The, like, I like, I was like, I am watching those wheels turn. Yeah, that's, and that's it's always like a sexy thing. It's her thing. I remember that's when I was trying works. to come up with a system, I was, it, it was like, we were trying to make a thing and it came out as ass. And I'm like, if that's not on brand, I don't know what is, There's the acronym. but going back is what I realize is people think they want a system, but they don't because then you're like here. Mm-hmm. So what I created is a system of hierarchy of places to look. So we're going to look at these four quadrants. We're going to look at um, visual vestibular. So based off the client and their client history, which I teach as well, we'll know where to start. Now, here's the freaking beauty of this. I had one of my mentees make a flow chart because I'm like, Someone in a flow else, chart, yeah. I'm always like, I can always maybe. Yeah. Well, maybe, right? Yeah. I'm always in the gray. So a flow chart to me, I'm like, well, it's never really a yes because what about this? And she was like, oh my God. So she's like, I'm going to make the flow chart. So I was like, good. And going through it, we created a flow chart so you can get here from there from people who have systems. But the beauty is it, beauty with it is if you're wrong, you just learn something. So you just right. assess something with that wrong choice. It leads you to the next thing. Because for me, um, it's all about sensory integration. So these are concepts that I feel are they've totally blown up, but there's no mm-hmm. meat to them. Joint differentiation, stability, and sensor integration. I said it uh, um, in one of my meetings, mm-hmm. and one of my students is like, you should make that a post. And I was like, good idea. S- there's a difference between sensory stacking and sensory integration. So sensory stacking, stacking a bunch of stuff, cool. That's going to be a challenge. But we don't know if that integrated. Um, so to piggyback another term that grinds my gears is neuroplasticity. People acting like that shit's easy. No Neuroplasticity problem. is not no easy. <laughs> it's like, yeah, just keep rubbing it out. No, because it's there's competitive funny. plasticity. And I can't measure. You have to have acetylcholine released in two locations, epinephrine. So, like, do we really know? But what we do know is things interfere with neuroplasticity. The eye's not focusing. The vestibular system moving too much. Pain spasticity, which we see in neuro, tightness, all these things interfere with neuroplasticity. So my job is not to be like, oh, I just create a new movement pattern. Let's do it 40 times. My job is to make sure the other things don't interfere so the brain can do the job, which is kind of why I loved Anna on first meeting. We both have a DO approach, but do things totally yes. different. Let the brain and the body sort that shit out. Yes. We're here I to help this. facilitate We're here to help facilitate. So, you know, you might not realize you do this all the time. You never do this. Okay. So Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you not to do that. I might make you do this while you're doing something else, maintaining that. So again, that wasn't a great example because people might be like, what the hell is she talking about? What I'm trying to say is I might bring what you do normally into your sensory environment and then see if you can maintain that while you do something else and integrate those two movements. Because if we can isolate a limb here, we can isolate a limb anywhere. But if we move the arm, mm-hmm. are they saying this, Shante, or am I just moving? You're willy saying it, the people on, on okay. YouTube are saying. <laughs> We're live on YouTube? No. Why don't I read gonna, the emails you send it's not, me? It's not live on YouTube. <laughs> when it goes up on YouTube, they <laughs> So if somebody's lifting their arm and not realizing they're moving their body, that's not going to create sensory integration. But if we move them, so can we all do a drill right now? Just you and me. That's we all, but yes. 
I well, mean, we're, the we all, we'll y'all it. Yes. But when yes. you're watching this, do this with me. Don't make me look like a loser. So what I want you to do is just lift your arm and watch yourself in the camera. Lift your arm. Okay. Do you notice that we're both moving a little bit when we're lifting our arm? Yes. It's not purely. Okay. People don't realize they're moving. So if you're like, now, Shante, don't move and lift your arm. Like we're gripping. So which direction are you moving in when you lift your arm? You talking to me? Asking me? I'm talking. No, I'm talking to the people who oh. aren't live. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, wait. I'm listening. I'm trying to be a host here. I'm moving in this. I have to go. I have to go look. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now take your hand to the side of your head of, that you're moving towards. The other hand. I'm not going to use one. Yeah, I'm but can you have hand. it on the side that you're moving towards? I know you yes. don't want to move your. Head. You know yeah. what it is? It's okay. actually because the camera's reversed, and that's why I'm like, what side of my fucking head am I touching? Oh, my <laughs> bad. So here's what I want to do: <laughs> lift your arm without pressing your head into your hand. Oh, look at that range of motion increase. Now, guys, when you watch on tape, did you notice what she did with her eyes? Is that, I, was, okay? I noticed what so I did with So I eyes. might then, she, you looked up and to the right, yeah. but if it's flipped, it could have been up to the left. So what we now know is the visual system's not integrating. So I would know my entry point would go right into the visual system. Proprioceptively wasn't the sauce. When I gave her a proprioceptive cue, I observed a shift in her eyes. Now, if hers lies locked in, so if I'm here doing that, what do you notice about my eyes? Straight ahead. Okay. So we know a visual cue isn't the sauce. It was the proprioceptive. So it really becomes simple. It's either a proprioceptive cue. You know, people get kind of all bugged out about that. It's like if you're giving a sensation or a joint-based cue, that's affecting proprioception. If you're giving a visual cue easy. And if we're giving vestibular cues, which everybody kind of ignores, dude, there is so much sauce there. It's really helpful. So we kind of have three options. I think one so of the things that- you have a 33.3% chance to be right or wrong. As people are listening to this, and one of my favorite things to do is to look to try and simplify things. And this is one of the, this is a discussion that Meg and I continue to have because she, her brain moves so quickly around this stuff. And I'm like, but wait a minute, I need to be under, able to understand it and I need to be able to explain it. And then we get to yep, have these talk discussions. Me through it. So one of the things that's cool about this and what I wrote down here is that the original question I had asked is people will feel overwhelmed. And I know that people just listening to this, the super nerds that are into the, neur the neuro side of things are like, yeah, give me more. The people that are more like me, trad very traditional ortho approach are, are probably like, whoa, 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 whoa. And for those folks that are overwhelmed, one of the things that Megan said in there that I want to back it up to is she talked about it's still being right if it's wrong. That's basically what she said. Even if you make the wrong decision, it's still information that you're learning. And I think that us ortho people can also understand what Megan's actually doing is removing the fragility that we think is around approaching things from a neuro approach. I know for me personally, and a part of it, I, just, I never even wanted to go into traditional neuro, but the way that the healthcare system is, the way that education is, people feel so frail and they feel so fragile. That's actually the word I want. They feel so fragile that you think yeah. if you do the wrong movement, like I think that if I like did an eye thing on somebody, they're going to die, right? Yes, I understand the, that if you're working with someone that has s significant true like neuro vestibular involvement, then you can overload things. But you can do that with anything. We can do it with tissues as well. Yeah. You see it happen all the fucking exactly. time. You just talking to them can overload them. Exactly. But I think that one of but the I things- would, that, You know what? It's interesting you say that. Listen, I've been doing this for 21 years. I've done a million evals on the most complex cases. I joke that I'm everybody's last resort. That's a good place That's to okay. be. That's okay. I get and the results. Are. Yeah. But, but what is really interesting is it's very rare that something goes wrong because again, so I always say to ortho people, so when we break it down in smaller parts, I know I just talked fast at you guys, but just break that, break it down. If we're changing the sensory environment, so if you're doing an orthopedic approach, say you're trying to mobilize the hip, you're using a hands-on approach. You're trying to change their proprioception, their brain's ability to know where they are. Okay. Now, what would also be interesting is, what are the eyes doing during that and the vestibular system? So a lot of times, like when people get, I went on a boat for the first time in my entire life without getting sick is by sensory integration. 
But what was happening to me is I was told my vestibular system was so fragile. Exactly mm -hmm. what you said. Yeah. Well, ever you've had it ever since you were a kid, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yep. and vestibular PT did actually not work for me. No shame to any mm -hmm. of my vestibular yep. PTs out there because guess what? My foundations weren't set. I was not reflexively stable enough to do that vestibular stuff. So number one, it always comes back to what I call reflex stability and I call yes, it reflexive because there's a big difference between gripping yep. and a reflexive response. Absolutely. Now, chill. I always say this to my students and you help me with this because I think I secretly didn't mean to was fear monger and gripping. I didn't mean to, but by saying that's a gripping pattern, don't grip. We're going to go into a gripping pattern. If you have to lift something heavy or do something, you know, people yeah. grip all the time. You know, packing your lats is actually a gripping pattern, but it helps you do a lift. Did anybody die? No, but I want my clients to be able to be, to respond to things, yes, not be always gripping and proactive. So if you're gripping, that's fine. You know, a lot of times teachers, yeah. they get it here, but they don't get it in their body because they're micromanaging it. And then they come to my studio, they do an yes, intensive and then they cry because they think they've been doing it wrong all the years. And I said, no, I just taught your body how to respond to that. I'm pretty uh, sure your body has been responding to other things. Yeah, absolutely. So, 100%. Can I piggyback before I'm, I'm just monopolizing this conversation. As I, I mean, do. it's your conversation. So I brought you on with the neuro stuff is think about it also this way. People get overwhelmed with the eyes, but eye exercises, I simplify it like this, a saccade or an eye jump is a plyometric. Okay. Gay. Um, so gay stabilization is an eye plank. I'm isometrically staring at you. Okay. Smooth pursuits is just kind of, you know, a linear movement. Okay. Convergence, all these mm -hmm. things Love equate this. to what we do in our body. Love so this. if you want gay stabilization is huge. It sounds like you're saying gay stabilization, just so you know. That could be okay as well. <laughs> That's what it sounds. The first thing you gaze, said, I was like, what? Jersey, G-A-Z-E, gaze stabilization is when your eyes can stabilize. Now, most people don't realize people's eyes are moving. The population I love to work with is people on the spectrum or autism or wherever they're at. A lot of times their bodies can't be still because their eyes can't be still. Oftentimes we force them to do things in their bodies. I did this great eval on this young boy in um, the UK. And when I would ask him to do something, he would either do it or not. When I asked him to sit on the floor, he did not move as if he was deaf. I asked him to sit in the chair, he did. So we established just from that observation He's got some proprioceptive issues at his SI joint because when he had to sit on the floor, mm -hmm. his pelvis would tuck under. So I said, maybe he doesn't sit on the floor and we let him sit in a chair where he can concentrate. Yeah. When he was sitting in the chair, he was able to do all these upper body exercises. Okay. So with the gay stabilization as I was doing reflexive stability drills with him before I did eye exercises, because if I force him to look and move his eyes, the foundational patterns aren't there. He can't gay stabilize. Oh. So the, I'm going to simplify it even further. Just move people's eyes around. Just don't do, don't do anything but move people's eyes around isolated from head and body. That's going to help them better gay stabilize. Okay. okay. So if you notice your clients looking all over the place, it's not that they're uninterested. They're searching for sensory input. Nice. So make them move their eyes and then leave it alone. Just start there. This right I am here. Very handsy today. <laughs> I'm here for it. Anyone that's watching, not even anyone. If you're listening to this, uh, and you know you're in your car or something like that, maybe pause it, and then when you get home, pick it up on the YouTube, put it on the big screen, so you can see just how animated she, Megan's. Actually, more animated than I am. Y'all know I say using my hands. I got a very animated face. Megan tops that. So yeah, maybe go. Well, I'm it still in there. Jersey. If you were exactly. still in Jersey, it probably would be I'd like. I went you to the West Coast the, and it got sucked out a little bit. I chilled out. A little bit. I did. The sun. I'm a little out. chiller when I'm on the left coast. <laughs> I mean, you know, one of the things takes a few that, days to get there. It does, and especially when you last time you came, weather was shit. But I, I, dig I digress. I digress. The last well, two times. I don't. I see. That's why Just I said I digress. Clear. I wasn't trying to bring it up again, Megan. I know what it was both times. I know. <laughs> Sensitive. <laughs> it's fine now, though. It's sunny. One of the things that, and we're going to get into this reflexive stability because this is something that makes so much sense to me. And anyone that is 
like me, any of you kind of true orthophiles or whatever you want to call yourselves, we understand this, right? And we understand, uh, Megan has said she's kind of was fear-mongering, uh, gripping. And what we say in, in kind of our space is that your stability needs to be appropriate for the, the demands of the task, right? Yes, if you're doing some max, well, one rep max, okay, yeah, you're going to Valsalva, you're going to brace, because that shit's heavy. If you're just bending up to pick up your shoe. I loved how to. you described that. I don't mean to interrupt. Years ago, huh. mm -hmm. I can't remember where it was. I think when you came to Jersey and was first met, was that it? So mm -hmm. it's like, guys, you're, you're doing way too much to do very little. Exactly. That. People trying to roll you over. Do it from someone who's in. always doing too much, uh -huh. <laughs> do less. That's it. That's it. I'm like, you're doing too much. So this is where But where I think Maggie's where it gets going. confusing is how do they do less? Totally. So it's like they have to do more because it's like they want to yep. feel something. At the 100%. end of the day, I don't mean to be like all spiritual about it, but everybody just wants to feel something. And totally. what I feel is different than what you feel. So going back to individualized education is like when people ask me what reflexive stability feels like, I go, what does happiness feel like? Yeah. And they're like, uh -huh. I'm like, serious. Because What does happiness feel, feel like? Yeah. Absolutely. 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 So Very interesting. And what the, I want to oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm going to ask a question that's going to have a long you answer first. from you. So maybe you go first. I, I feel like I'm ready to move on. Sometimes I beat a dead horse and circle the drain. So we're going to stay though around there because okay. I want to talk about with, as it relates to this, this reflexive stability. I'm trying to think how I want to phrase this. Where are we looking at it? Where are we looking for it at? I don't like putting the preposition at the end of the sentence, but I'm going to do it anyway. Where are we looking for it? And how does that tie so into you want to give me to give all my secrets away? That's it. What about my course? I'm totally kidding. <laughs> I'm giving it. I love it because I want people to hear this. You and I talked about this. You're like, Megan, you're taking, you're assuming you more incompelled me, my mom. I assumed that when I'm talking about the four quadrants, I teach anatomy a little different. You have four pelvi. So we've got our clavicle, scapula, humerus, clavicle, scapula, humerus. Then we've got our pelvi down below. The difference between the upper quadrant and the lower quadrant is the SI joint. So our scapulas, let's like, you know, let's put a string between yeah. our shoulder blades. What if we had an SI joint there? We wouldn't be able to do this with our arm. So the SI joint is limiting the movement of the femur and the pelvis. But going back even simpler, more simple or simpler, which is the word? I like simpler. Grammar is not I my know, strength. But I'm, like, I'm just like, what sounded better there? Yeah, whatever. Or more simply. You're like, but why those four quadrants? I'm like, yes. because I said so. And then I'm like, because they're the most mobile joints in the body. People aren't moving. And you're like, and that's it. I was like, I never said that out loud. I assumed it. So our ball in the socket, glenohumeral joint, is the most mobile joint in the body. But what's interesting is, Shantae, do you think you can differentiate your AC joint from your glenohumeral? No, but, Megan, it ain't happening for me. OK, yeah. so what happens is people are not using their glenohumeral. They're obsessed about the shoulder blade, blah, 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 but you're not even using your glenohumeral. OK, same thing with the hip joint. So femur and acetabulum. That's a very mobile joint. We are not using our hip joint. It's very hard. So everybody right now, touch your pubic bone. It's your pubic bone. Touch your SI joint and touch your hip joint. They're very close together. That's the other assumption I don't make is people cannot differentiate them. So giving them a clamshell, all mm. they're going to do is what's available. You no. need to show yes. their brain what else is available and then let that shit ride. Now, remember when I was in California, I was testing because mm -hmm. upper quadrant to me, you yes. want to fix your client's gait, all your neuro clients. Let me tell you, the sauce is actually in the upper quadrant. Um, the beautiful things we're saying with alcohol quadrant stability, that's the next study we're going to be doing, is it doesn't cure anxiety, it doesn't cure depression, it doesn't cure anything, but it helps people do higher level things. So meaning, if your brain is micromanaging and trying to stabilize you, especially in the upper quadrant, there becomes a lot of tension, a lot of people, it, we see increased level of anxiety, especially in hypermobile people. Yes. I had this new woman, yes. she basically got a spinal cord injury from all the cortisone injections they were doing. And she has such chronic headaches just with lower quadrant reflexive stability. One drill. She's like, why do I not feel the headache? It literally went away. Okay. So what 
people are doing all these interventions, but they didn't change the check the foundation of her house. There's a huge crack in her foundation. Okay. So back to what we were talking mm-hmm. about is I wanted to say, I want to go upper quadrant first. I want to do that. And then I tested it on you. I tested it on every client that week I saw. It wasn't it. Amazing. And the reason why it's so complicated, the shoulder joint is way more complicated yeah. than the hip. So foot to hip, our foot is usually closed chain and walking. We're used to that feedback from foot to hip. Also, you kind of oh, feel your ass working. Yeah. Okay. And then to get the pelvis move around legs, you're going to feel, I always say, everybody wants to look better naked. So when you feel that abs and ass working, you might get buy-in. Upper quadrant reflex stability, you know, people don't care about their neck abs Mm -hmm. until they're older. Mm -hmm. Okay? Nailed it. So what happens, it's not as big of a buy-in. So I said, you know what? Why am I going in trying to teach calculus to people who don't know how to add and subtract? So I teach this foundational. We go through the whole series. So in my advanced neurotechniques course, we break it down. We not only break down lower quadrant, upper quadrant stability, reflexive. We also break down learning styles, how to observe, um, how to adjust your style. And my favorite part of the first weekend is the emails I get. People are like, oh, my God. This is why that client and I don't get along or that didn't work. They had these huge aha moments. And I want them to take the learning style changes first because I don't want teachers to change who they are. Then at the end of the course, we take all that stuff we learned and we integrate it with visual and vestibular. I also thought about mm-hmm. bringing visual vestibular early, but mm-hmm. guess what? You get quick wins with visual and vestibular, but not integration mm-hmm. that, because it's the foundational that. shit that's cracked. This. This is also refocus- <laughs> one of the reasons I love Megan's approach because she's articulating things that I felt uh, as I was kind of nearing the end of my career uh, with my treating side of things and the vestibular stuff was getting really big and eyes were getting really big. You know, I brought I, the boys from IKN on. I love them. Um, Z Health, all of that. Yeah, there's love people it. doing great stuff. Love it. But I would never bought in that that would be the best place to start in terms of I want prolonged carryover. We all learned about neurological trickery and that's what I was feeling like. There was a lot of like, I could get a quick win and I'm like, but I, I wanted know. to be It always forever. felt like trickery to me too. I needed a why. That. Now, that. what's interesting, the only clients I start with visual are my athletes because you do not go effing up an athlete's proprioception during sport, okay? Yeah. So what's interesting is I work with this young, um, just recently won a big tournament, under 12 tennis, uh, he's 12, he is 12 years old and an t- excellent tennis player. That there was a really go. hard sentence. There we go. All we worked on was foot to hip and VORs, just a vestibular ocular effect. So you know where I threw that in? He's hypermobile. So I'm like, when you oh, get tired, yeah. yeah, I just want you to do a VOR. So look at something and turn your head. So it helps his eyes refocus. Listen, tennis is all about mm-hmm. the eyes being able to jump and track and seeing the ball in. I didn't go crazy with him. And his mother said, Megan, it's crazy. He does it all the time. And you know, a 12 year old kid is not going to do shit that doesn't help exactly. him. Question for you, Meg. He's coming back and we're going to add in another piece. And what was interesting to me, I'm totally going sports for a minute because yeah, I can talk sports going. with you. Keep going. A lot of my um, neuro teachers or my Pilates teachers are like you with the sports references. I have a father who's a huge sports fan and a two daughters. So I'm very ESPN educated and I married a coach. Anyway, Bo Jackson. Remember him? Bo knows. Mm-hmm, yeah, of course. He was powerful as hell. He actually dislocated his own hip. Talk about strength. However, he was neurologically weak. You don't know this? Google no, that I, shit. Watch that's, that's it. He's running strength. and he. So, that's yes, him. because he posteriorly dislocated his femur because he put his leg out. And the, what happened is foot, his hip didn't respond to his foot because he was so effing powerful that the hip went back. That's then just... he rolled on it, relocated it. Okay. Now, Bo Jackson was a professional baseball player and a professional football player. There's not many of those. And he was great. He wasn't good. Okay, so Google the Bo knows if you're under 40, you might not know Bo knows. They did a commercial and it was like, oh, Bo knows tennis and he would play with the best tennis players. Anyway, for me, it was actually his visual acuity and his ability to integrate that with proprioception. So we're on Bo Jackson. Okay, I'm a running back. 
So he had such a big visual field that he could take in that whole field. And what's interesting is whoever moves first loses, right? You played soccer. Mm -hmm. So if I go to the, the right, mm -hmm. where are you going to go? Yeah, I'm going to the left. The left. You zig, I'm uh, zag. In tennis, there's poaching. So what I do is I never poach because once you poach, people know you're going there. And if you play someone that's good, they're just going to hit it over there. So what I do is I don't look at the ball. And right when they hit it, I'm going to respond right and left based off where their racket's facing. Because if I move before them, they can change their racket, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So Bo was able to see the whole visual field and was able to up, 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 up off those people. Then we talk about baseball. Okay, baseball, he was able to see a ball come in, converge with peripheral vision at the same time. And guess what sport he does now? Golf? I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of sports. <laughs> Archery. Uh, okay, I was like something shooting, something with accuracy there. Got it, got it. Okay. okay, so very interesting about, so get excited about the visual field. Listen, it might not flip the coin, but opening up their visual field is going to help their body do more things, and especially athletes that need to do weird shit with their body. The kid that okay? came to you, Meg, he came to you, and I know the kid doesn't tell me his name or anything like that, but are these people coming to you for pain or coming to you for performance? Um, Performance? His mother knows me and saw, didn't realize I played tennis. And I just started after playing, I haven't played in 10 years. I'm playing better now than I played when I was in high school. Okay. Just by working that sensory integration. I do practice what I preach. I do the shit I teach every day. And I can't say that a lot about a lot of people. Okay. Yeah. Not to talk shit, but I just totally. did. Yeah. Um, so she, he was very hypermobile and she's like, do you think this stuff will help? I'm like, bring him down. Right. And kids are so easy to work with because, oh, my God, it's either a yes or a no. Yeah. If they're not paying attention to you, shut up. I did that. I don't remember the thing yeah, I did I with my that. niece yep. with the Girl Scouts. Yep. Got a little girl. She's like, I can't do a push up. Got her to do a push up. But when I started talking about the names of the muscles, they're all mm -hmm. like, that ain't it. And the funny thing, parents, I'm a parenting expert. I have no children. So obviously I'm an expert. <laughs> but when I asked these kids, all the kids, their least favorite class was language arts. Because there's a lot of words that they have to learn, but they don't really understand the meaning. So when I was saying, we have I abs, I was trying to be cute about it, like our rectus abdominis, you know, our rectus superior. As soon as I started saying nah. words that didn't have a meaning to awesome. them, it was like this. And their mothers are like, girls, behave. And I'm like, it's fine. And I said, how about we use our I abs? And then we just did movement. So like, it's so interesting in the course, my advanced course yes. to go back to it. Parents are like, oh my God. I am better communicating with my child or my husband. I used to say to Brian, look at me when I'm talking to you, to my husband. Mind you. He's a big man. He's much taller. He's a big man. Big, well, you know what's man. interesting? It's hard for him to gaze stabilize. When he's looking at me, he doesn't listen as well. Brian actually will have, he will be cooking with music on and the TV on, and he'll be talking to me. I'm an auditory learner, but I can't have more than two auditory stimulus or I lose my shit, like literally. So I'm like, you got to turn off one of the things, but he actually hears better. He'll be doing something and he hears me when I talk. When I'm doing work, I say to him, don't talk to me when I'm doing work. I can't hear you. Nah. We have like role reversal. Yeah. People always say men don't listen. <laughs> don't I listen. can only listen when that's the only thing I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. I love this. So I want cool. you. So I want you to dive into this. This is why this shit is so cool. It helps course, you be a better exactly. human. This is what I want. So one of the reasons I brought Megan cool. on is to talk about her course. After working with her, really getting to dive into how her brain works and what all this was about, I was like, dude, I get it. Fuck yes, I want people that are still treating to know about this. So I was like, let me also bring you on and let's talk about the course. So this is a great segue because you kind of looped it back into learning styles and, 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 and individualizing someone's treatment. So can you run me through what is this? What's this course, Meg? Yeah. So the advanced neuro techniques. So we've got the neuro studio. We focus on neurological conditions. So after we've got a Pilates for neurological conditions workshop where you learn about um, the pathology. So you'll learn about MS, Parkinson's, stroke, the symptoms, stuff you can do for it. And now, PTs, let me tell you how we we have developed a new way to work with spasticity. 
Okay. Any person you talk about spasticity as a response and to use it, they are usually a neuro studio trained teacher. So it was not the shit I learned in school, man. Totally different. Oh. So PT sometimes poo poo that course because they think they know it. It's different. Take a shot. Yeah. But the advanced neuro techniques is we now take, you have all this information. Now, how does this work actually in practice? So we meet, I don't do this course in person anymore, and I'll tell you why. I used to do this two days in a row. It's too <gasps> much, man. Imagine this uh, for two no. days straight. People were like, this was so fun, but I don't remember anything. That. No okay? So it's over three months. We meet one week in a month. We start with kind of the Megan's neuro background. We talk about how to learn. We do cerebellum. We do all this stuff in the front end. I review neurological conditions. A lot of people who take this course don't want to work with neurological conditions. They just want to have better strategies for their clients. So we do the first week. The first day is all about that. Then we talk about the cerebellum in day two, which, you know, I'm obsessed with. And then we talk about lower quadrant stability. Then we talk about upper quadrant stability. Then we integrate visual and vestibular the last weekend. So you walk away each weekend with stuff you're going to work on. Now, some people, I know I'll look at a student and be like, it'll all come together on weekend through. Usually after the first day, people are like, what the fuck did I sign up for? I'm overwhelmed. But something I also got from you, so thank you, is at the end of every course, even if I have to stay on an extra half hour, I let everybody share what their take home was. Because that's super important. I want you to implement this on Monday. That's important to me. It won't work if you don't do it. I encourage mistakes. We learn way more from mistakes than we do successes. That's the truth, right? Nice. Full circle that's just how it there. is. Full circle moment. There. Yeah. That's what you said earlier about flow charts. Yeah. You've got to make mistakes because the cerebellum, I almost call it, it used to be back in the day, they're like, oh, the cerebellum's like the helper. It's like in the background. Number one, the cerebellum, there's varying numbers, but the smallest number is 50% and the largest I've seen is 80%. 50 to 80% of all the neurons in the brain are in the cerebellum. So maybe we should be paying more attention to it. It's like a different nugget. I mean, look at my little brain here. It looks different. So yeah. <laughs> that to me is like a, a big aha. But um, I lost my train of thought. Where was I? Oh, the three months. And what I do is I kind of stage you through it. I give people advanced movement flows because our kinesthetic learners need to feel it in their body. Okay. Now there's debate on, I don't like making you a kinesthetic learner. Everybody's multidimensional. So you're not just a kinesthetic learner, but a lot of people need to move to feel. Okay. Then we have observation they can do so there's all to touch on different how different people learn and why i'm so i love teaching this course is the results i can confidently say and the only other person i know who says this and i know she does this it's no bullshit is anna we can guarantee results yes, yes. in a You're session right. with me mm -hmm. i am going to guarantee a change i can do that and i'm telling you i was always yes. like 90 percent 92, 94, like you, we were always good, but this shit makes, because yes. when something doesn't go right, it tells us where to go. We find a thing. The person leaves with a, aha, we're good. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'm really so passionate about this because it's, it's really improved my life. I mean, I had a Pilates studio for years, brick and mortar. I left, sold it and was going to work for my dad in insurance. I was like you, I was burnt the fuck out. I wasn't happy, okay, because I was getting like 92% and it it sucked. Yeah. This, I see, you know this, we talk about this, I still see clients every day with the exception yeah. of Sundays. And I do that because that's how I learn the best. I'm not bragging, but I run two businesses, the Neuro Studio and Copal Method and do our Instagram. And my students are like, how do you do this? Because I schedule shit, how it works for me. But if I'm not with clients in the weeds, I lose my touch. But it allows me to do that shit. Totally. Right? I've been going since 7 this morning. I could keep going. Certain oh days. God. Yesterday was not a good day. I was very cranky. But this, this has just made my life better financially as well. Um, it's helped me be a better version of myself and really understand who I am as a human. It's made me a better mentor. Um, I think it's helped me connect to others like you, like I joined legacy. I have a very successful business. I yeah. wanted to 
branch out to something new, but I'm always the boss. I was so empowered and felt so good being in that room of badass women. And, you know, I always was kind of like, "Mm, am I too good for this kind Uh of thing? But it wasn't that. It was like they were all high level people, too. And I felt like really seen and supported. And it's nice to have a sounding board on like minded people. Also, guys, these courses, these mentorships, that shit's a business expense. Be tight with your business. Mm-hmm. I want I want people to treat it like a business. This is not a hobby. This, this. You can have both. You can love what you do, but still make a living. A good living. Make a good living. I was going to say, that make okay a to very say? good living. I was, I was like, I'm going to say it. Make a really, really good living. I played tennis for two hours today. She almost died, folks. I would have uh, never been able out. to do that in the past. This What'd you say? She said she almost died, folks, but she made I know. It. <laughs> she texted me to tell me. She's like, listen, it was fucking hot. But oh, I was I was on the struggle bus and it wasn't even that hot. And I complained the whole time. I feel like I was that person. But like everybody was laughing. And then I'm like, <laughs> I don't do well in the heat. Dude, you know what you like. And that's fine. Nothing wrong with it. I know. I, I, I don't like the cold the either. I like a moderate temperature. <laughs> L.A., baby. L.A. You folks listening. This is why I brought Megan on that last bit there. You've heard her energy this whole entire episode. You can hear how intelligent she is. You can hear how passionate she is. And then she just blended, just married the life, the business side of things as well. And this, that, rather, I'm pointing at the thing you can't see, that, that she just said, is why I brought her on here. And that is why I wanted you folks listening to hear her approach. It's why I've brought other people on in the past, because my whole shtick, build, live, actually experience your best life. And I want to give you all the tools possible for that. And if I was still treating, this is absolutely an approach that I'd be looking at because especially like you said, that last part from a business perspective, you got to be able to fucking guarantee results. It's it. When we first start out, we don't know. We're kind of learning things. And when, if you ever flip the script and you have the issue, you have the pain, you have the problem. When you go to a provider, you don't want to fucking, it depends and no answer after that. You want someone who you know can help you. It's not like, oh, I need you to fix me, but you want a result. I want that for you folks. And I want you to be able to figure out whatever approach that's going to be. And after working with Megan, I was like, I want people to know that this thing exists so that they can go and, you know, dive into it, go in and look and see if it fits for them. Can I say one more thing? And then give me the information where they can find it. Yeah. So something, an interesting observation I had Observing somebody else's course, nobody in this room or sphere, um, it was like a show. It was like, look at what I can do with my hands and manipulate yes. someone's body. And it rubbed me the wrong way. So I sat back and thought, do I do that a little bit? And I didn't mean to. But when you're showing stuff hands on and a technique, I felt the people who had my hands on them were like, oh, my God, this is life changing. And everybody watching it, some people got it and other people were like, I will never be able to do that. So how I changed it and COVID really created a big shift for me. I have people that are bedridden. So I get sometimes I actually get better results on Zoom because we have to work on sensory integration. I can't do as much. Like, it's crazy. Nick, who had a stroke at 13, which I've shared with you, Mm -hmm. just recently got engaged. We posted of what we practiced was getting him down to the knee and up because it kept increasing his spasticity. And when he increased his spasticity, he couldn't talk, okay, from his stroke. So there's people, let me, two things. So number one, everything I teach in the course There is not one person listening that can't do it too. I am adamant about that. I am not putting fairy dust on people. I am not doing anything that is like, everything I do, I am going to teach you how to do it. We talk through, I make people ask, ask questions. We get interactive. So that's what I want people to hear. And the other thing is people need you guys. They need good practitioners. The shit I hear every day is frightening. I just did an eval on a woman who's been doing shoulder PT. And I was like, now I never bad mouth a practitioner because totally. I don't believe in that. Yeah. But what was interesting is she was doing all these exercises, but her brain mapped her cervical spine, her entire upper quadrant, right and left arm, and lumbar spine, the same thing. So when she was mm-hmm. doing her right arm exercises, her brain map could not go, go back, go back to school, the sensory homoculus, yeah, yes, right? There it is. Motor, there it like, is. 
That shit, they're all next to each other. Her brain thought those were all one thing. So then when she's going to walk and trying to arm swing, no why way. are we surprised yeah. that everything's moving? Exactly. Yeah. So like... people need you guys. I have a wait list. I refer out all the time. We need qualified practitioners. I'm telling you, if you're struggling in your business or you want to feel the passion again, like come on over to the dark side, meaning the neuro studio side. I got you. Bad. I need your help. I do. Bad. I can't do it myself. Meg, how do they do this? Likes me. I know it's hard to believe. Fuck those people. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, how do, <laughs> where do they find you? How do they do this? Where can they get more information? How can they sign up for wait lists? All the things. Let me know. We're going to put in the show notes, folks, but I like to have the, the guest articulate these. Things. I'll start at the easiest. Instagram. The Neuro Studio. Got also, it. my personal uh, my other side business where I see clients, also non-neuro clients, is the Cop. No, that's not my Instagram Back name. It it's up. Meg Copel Duffy. That's it. Okay, I my name it. Megan is spelled weird, so I took that shit out. Copel is two P's, one L. Get that shit right. Um, it's a picture of me and my dog. That's where I talk a little bit more about the mentorship, the learning styles, non-neuro stuff. Neuro Studio, you're going to get stuff like that. Websites, the Neuro Studio copelmethod.com easy as that so you'll get all that information there um we've got us we've got special bonuses coming up in august um we got a lot of cool shit coming out you know i know someone who's great at sales who's taught me a few things some early action bonuses we also have a special bonus from yours truly boom boom boom, um, boom this boom. is me putting you i'm holding you Okay, so a little bonus from Shantae. So when you take that course, you'll get that bonus as well. So make sure you get on the wait list. You'll see it at the Neuro Studio or just go on Instagram or just send me a message to say hello. Obviously, I like to talk to people. It's my favorite part about her. Meg. That's right. Got to have some fun. We're going to have some fun. This is fucking awesome. All right. I always know you're going to bring the energy. I always love our conversations, whether it's on Voxer or texting. And I was like, yo, this podcast is going to be. Oh my, can you tell them my Voxer message is what they sound like? <laughs> They sound like this, folks. They sound a little bit frantic. No, no. Because I, I them think up I'm doing well. voice to text. I, I'll be like, period, space. Mm -hmm. Period. People, that's the learning curve there. It's fine. It's the learning curve. And I expect it. And I just laugh. So it's, it's great. I hope that you folks listening to this, well, how do I want to phrase it? I hope that your eyes have been opened. I know that Meg speaks fast. I know that she... The, the the information can come very, very quickly. But I also know that this is a very, very open-minded, very, very educated, very curious audience. And that is why I brought her on. No, no decisions have to be made in this moment. I just wanted to put her on your radar no. if she wasn't there already. And this way, when that moment is right and you're like, you know what? I want to be able to guarantee results. You know what? I'm ready to kind of dive into that neuro approach. You know what? I have this issue and maybe I want to learn more about it. You know what? I have some time and I want to explore this. You know what? I just want to laugh. I'm going to hit Megan up. You know what? I got celiac. I want to go and get some gluten-free Oreos. When that moment comes, I just want you to have someone that's going to be top of mind. And I, I hope, it's my hope that that is going to be Megan. We've put all the things in the show. And notes. I do talk fast when I lecture, but we give you the recordings for life so that you can review them. And my rule of thumb with me is when you hear a nugget that resonates, you turn it off. Let that marinate. Because if you get all these beautiful nuggets in a course, you're only going to remember the last nugget. So I tell my students, we're going to do it live. I talk fast. I always will. I am not going to change. I often curse. This is how I talk. So I like people to know that. Because if you're like, I can't stand the sound of her voice, that's not going to change. <laughs> okay? But with the recording, you can slow me up. You can speed me down. But I always find is if you stop it when I say something that resonates and just let that sit. That, that right there. I'm going to make that meta and leave the episode there. Just let that sit. Meg, thank you. We had to reschedule a little bit. I love bit. you. I mean it. I love you too, for real. That's why I'm bringing you on, and just I'm grateful to have you in in my ecosystem at all. And I, anything I can do to same here to share this message with people, you know that I'm fully fully on board. Can so. I give one more person a shout out? Do it from another one of your group. So if you're thinking about your any of Shantae's groups, um, 
being around all those like-minded practitioners was really wonderful. And like Missy, yes, okay, she does neuro stuff too. Missy Bond. She was looking at my Instagram. She's like, girl, have you ever heard of a cover photo? And I was like, what's a cover photo? So in real time, shared with me something that really helped the neuro studio get the message across. So it's being in your orbit and the people around you. It's it's truly women and people identify or men, whoever's in this circle is really supporting other people. So that to me, you don't see that a lot. And uh -huh. that is because of you. So I am very appreciative of that. And I had to shout out Missy for the thanks with the cover graphics. Because mm -hmm. now everybody's like, how do you do that? And I was like, well, let me show you. <laughs> so sorry, we had a good moment to end, but I wanted to compliment you. you? Go? Oh, there you go. You dropped it. You dropped away, but we're back. But we're back. Oh, sorry. You're back. I, I said, I'm sorry. It. We wanted to end it on a great note, but I, I wanted to share that. You know what? I think that that's actually dope because that speaks to the type of person that Megan is. Megan's going to end an episode by shouting somebody out. That's the kind of person that you're going to get if you work with her. We got all the things in the show notes, folks. As always, endlessly appreciative for every single one of you. We know that you could have been doing anything else and you chose to listen to us. And for that, we are both endlessly, endlessly, endlessly appreciative. My only ask, if you like this episode, if you love this episode, if you're picking up what we are putting down, do me a solid and go connect with Megan. That is my ask. Do me a solid and go connect with Megan. If you want to share the episode, amazing. But more than that, let's let's go and sign into those DMs and, and give Meg a little hello. All right? All right. Officially Thank wrapping you. it up. Until next time, friends, Maestro and Megan out.